Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this uh, opportunity to have an interview with Dr. Ed Welch. This is an RTS Charlotte President's Forum. Every once in a while when we have a special guest on campus, uh, I take an opportunity just to spend some time with that individual to interview them for the community and for the students and for area pastors to introduce their ministry to folks and for them to learn more about RTS and what we're trying to do here uh, with those folks when they visit. So thank you for being a part of this. I know that many folks here are in this class this week, uh, taking this class with Dr. Welch. Some are area pastors and just community leaders that are here to learn more about the counseling program. So welcome to all of you. We're glad you're with us. And we have a special guest, of course, Dr. Welch, who's here to join us. Most of you who are in the students who are students this week already know Dr. Welch and probably needs no introduction to you. But for those of you who aren't familiar with him, Dr. Welch has uh, been, over, I think, over 30 years up at, in the counseling ministry up at CCEF in Philadelphia, the Christian, since 1981, the Christian Counseling and Educational Foundation up there, uh, which is a tremendous organization in the world of biblical counseling that we're really partnering with in our new degree program here. Dr. Welch has been in that ministry as both counseling and faculty member and has written numerous books. Many of you are probably familiar with some of the books Dr. Welch has written and maybe even have read some of them. One of his most famous books is When People Are Big and God is Small. And I think your most recent work is Running Scared. Shame is that Interrupted. Right? Shame Interrupted. He writes so, books so fast, I can't keep track of them here uh, in terms of how often they're coming off the press. The most recent one I have is a book called Running Scared, which is on anxiety and worry. That uh, is really a useful book, and I'm sure many of you have read Dr. Welch's books. Before we jump into this interview time with him, I just wanted to say a few words about the program here at RTS. For those of you who are students, I know you're familiar with it, but for those of you who are new, you may not realize that this is the very first year we're offering a new degree program in biblical counseling. We're very excited about it at RTS. For years, I used to go around to our alumni when they graduate and ask them, so hey, I know you've had a good experience here at RTS Charlotte, but what do you think we could improve on? And our alums, almost to a person, would regularly say, you know, I had a great experience at RTS, but I would love to have more counseling classes. They recognized that once they got into ministry, this is particularly something they realized once they got on the field, that they realized they didn't really necessarily have all the tools they wanted to try to apply God's word into the lives of their people. And that really is what the biblical counseling program is about. It's about applying God's Word in the lives of individuals. That's the vision for it here at RTS Charlotte. So we started a new master's degree, 66 credit hours in biblical counseling, as well as some dual degrees with the MDiv and even an MDiv with a counseling emphasis. We're very excited about these programs. One of the things that makes them unique is that nearly half of the classes in the master's degree are in Bible and theology. And that's very intentional. Half are in counseling, half are in Bible and theology, because we believe biblical counseling requires the Bible as its foundation. So we're excited about that. Now, one of the criticisms that's been uh, offered to biblical counseling, because it doesn't operate within a clinical environment, is that people who get a biblical counseling degree, what can they go do? Um, if they can't go work in a clinic, then maybe there's nothing for them to do. So answer that objection, Dr. Welch. What, what do you see as the benefits for biblical counseling training for the church and for even vocational ministry? Mm. I think of, I'll think of that in a few different ways. One is, this is a little bit off the topic, but, but I've, in, in, in my history of, of talking to people before they've gone to, to seminary, after they've gone to seminary, nobody's ever regretted a, a real solid biblical education. And I, I've, I've, I've yet to find somebody. With all the sacrifices involved in the seminary education, I've yet to find anyone Say, oh, I wish I wouldn't have done that. I wish I, wish, I wish I would have done something much shorter. So that's, that's, that's worthwhile for us to understand, that, that, that those who have been able to do such a thing, they have found it to be of value no matter what they've done, whether, whether they work as engineers or whether they, they have no formal vocation. The, the students that I've seen from, from Westminster, which is our primary location over the, over the last 20 years, they have gone into missions, they have gone into care of missionaries. Uh, uh, sometimes it's traveling to different mission fields, working with team dynamics, working with dealing with conflicts in the field. Uh, sometimes it's been doing that from the home office. They have, they have worked on pastoral staffs. The, m- most churches do not have, most mid-sized churches, they, they, their, their second and third hire is not going to be a counselor or a person who can train counseling for the most part. 
but so as a result, in the smaller churches, we find people who are hired to oversee small groups, which would be, I think that would be the natural venue for this, to, to be trained small group leaders. Small groups is where people are sharing their hearts. So it's to, to oversee small group leaders is, is, is been a, has been a natural venue. Uh, with women, the, the women tend to be hired a little bit later in, in church staffs, but we've had women who have been hired to oversee women's ministries, which has been a delight to see. We've seen women who've worked with pregnancy centers. We've seen women who've worked with adoption centers. We've seen, we've seen people who, who cannot be employed full-time in the context of a church, and so they've gone to an area where, where there's been a group of churches who have said, we want somebody who we can, we can entrust with the care of those that we love, who, who's going to be saying something consonant with what we're giving in the pulpit. And, and so we have seen students, men and women, who have, who have relocated to those kinds of places, and, and they've been able to work out a full-time job by, by having relationships with, say, three, four, or five different churches. There, there's, there's some of the things that people have done. Yeah, that makes me think. One of, the, one of the things about your answer, Dr. Welch, is that I think most people see a limitation on where you can go with biblical counseling because maybe they define counseling too narrowly. Um, one of the ways I like to say it, and I, I've said it to the students several times, is I view biblical counseling, at least in the way we're doing it at RTS Charlotte, is sort of the private ministry of the Word. It's, it's ministering the Word of God in a, in a one-on-one context where maybe you would conceive of preaching as the public ministry of the Word in a corporate context. And once you realize that counseling is really ministering the Word and applying the Word in a more personal level to individual problems, and suddenly all kinds of avenues open up for the use of a counseling degree. Absolutely. Everything from youth ministry to campus ministry to women's ministry to uh, uh, small group ministry, and it's just a, a wide open affair. I just picked up a, a book over the last week on, on, it was on Puritan conversations, and it had the, they used the word conference. It apparently yeah. was a technical term for the Puritans, and it, it, was, it was biblical counseling. It was, it was people hear the sermons, and, and, the, and they, you know, obviously they, they do something with it, but, but the, the Puritan pastors were trying to organize people in early small groups and they would say, go at it. Talk, talk about important things among yourselves. And in, in, in these conferences, that they would call them, they were, they were mostly lay-oriented. Occasionally, the pastor would drop in. But people would speak about their lives. They, that, that question, here's the sermon. Here's what I'm struggling with with my kid. Here's, my, here's, here's the sermon. Here's the tension we had in our relationship. How do they come together? That was, that was the prominent question in the conference, and that's, that's our question. Yeah, that's a great question. That's a great question. I'm going to pass that on to Mike, but I'll, I'll say yeah. a couple things first. No, I really, I, I, I do. Time want... is up. Uh... <laughs> Just a couple of thoughts. Um, I have a colleague, Paul Tripp, who wrote a book called Dangerous Calling. He's trying to identify these very issues. And, and, but I guess my, my, the, 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 the concern I have is he's calling pastors to be able to minister to one another and get help, but there's no structure to do such a thing. And how do we create those kinds of structures? That's, that's, that's a long-term problem. So, so in lieu of some of the structures, what do we have? We have pastors who are willing to express their weakness in, in culturally appropriate ways to their congregation. You don't have to share all your sins. You don't have to share all your sufferings. But you can share your weakness and be asking for prayer from, from the people in your church. That, that seems like a small thing, but it's a huge thing. Uh, for, for, during the class... I hope my class realizes that one of the things I'm trying to do is not, not make my life more difficult for pastors and, 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 and make them completely overwhelmed with the amount of pastoral care. I want them to, I want them to just have confidence that in, in 20 hours or in two minutes, they can do really fine pastoral care, <laughs> whatever, whatever they're being called to. Yeah, the, other, the other thing in class we've been talking about is how can we see the good in another person? How can we be, be people who specialize in seeing the work of the Spirit? I, I would say that as a counselor, that well, being a counselor is very easy. It's very sanitary. You know, you know what I'm saying? People, they come for an hour, and they, they, they rarely call me in the middle of the night, and, and, and I don't have to do their funerals. I, you know, they're, they're, it, it's, it's, strangely, it's a strange vocation. It's just strangely sanitary. Uh, yet... Yeah, it, it's certainly done, done rightly. It should be burdensome if you love people. And, 
And I find that the burden is almost always outweighed by every single day because I get a chance to know people close up. I see the work of the Spirit. It's, I, my, my faith is encouraged as I see this truly is the age of the Spirit where the Spirit is on the move in people's lives. And so I think sometimes even, even that, to, to, because the pastor is just surrounded by so many struggles and conflicts, it seems so intractable. But in the midst of it, to be able to see the Spirit truly is on the move. Other issues are largely are, are larger institutional and societal issues, and so I'd like your your, your thoughts. No, I mean this is a real problem. Of course, we know that here at RTS about pastoral burnout. We know it's a challenge. We know that you get in the ministry and there are very high rates of depression and despondency, and uh, and and people after a while look for other options. So we we really want to work hard to to uh, sort of inoculate that before people graduate. I really think this new biblical counseling program can help do that. I mean. Any pastor or any counselor needs to recognize that they need to be not only the deliverers of their craft, but the recipients of their craft at one level. And I think that that's just an important reminder as, as we think about uh, pastoral ministry. Can I, can I just say sure. just, yep. just one other thing? that, that um, There's hardships in life, and, but our interpretation of those hardships really does reconfigure the weight of, of the hardships. So a pastor is, is, feels like the entire church is collapsing around him or her. And the people he loves are the people who speak about him behind his back, are the, are the, are the people who are constantly criticizing him, and the, the people who are comparing him to the pastor they think would be better who's down the street or whatever it might be. That is, that is just treacherous. Until, from my perspective, you read 2 Corinthians, and 2 Corinthians, if I understand some of what Paul is up to, he's, he's, giving the, he's giving the paradigm for pastoral ministry. And he's saying, here's, I think I got it now. It's going to be done in weakness, and, and it's, it's following in Christ. And here's what we have in Christ. Everybody turns against him. And I'm not trying to have pastors be paranoid, and I'm not trying to have pastors to, to think that all the problems in church they have nothing to do with it because sometimes they do. Uh, so, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm assuming those things. But, but to, to see that, that when things are very difficult in the church, it's, it has been prophesied. It has been foretold. And this is, this is part of the calling that it will be very hard. That's, that, that, makes it, that makes the burden lighter. <laughs> to recognize that, that you're not isolated and here are all these other people thriving and you're dying. Here is... Oh, you're in the footsteps of the Messiah. Oh, no, I, now I recognize this. It, 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 it does change things. I know that some of you may want to learn more about the program we have here at RTS Charlotte. Certainly you can always go to our website at rts.edu and look up the Charlotte campus and learn more about it. There's also a table in the back with all kinds of materials about the counseling program and upcoming classes. We'd love for you to check that out. Well, I wish we had more time to take more questions, but time is up and upon us. Join me as we thank Dr. Welch for his time with us today. We are grateful, Dr. Welch, not only for this, this hour. I know, you know, here you have a busy professor teaching a week-long class, and we burn up his whole lunch break uh, to come here and talk more. Uh, as I, a, I got as, a free lunch. Yeah, yeah well, hey, a, you know, paper, you look at the so. bright side. So as a faculty member, I, I'm sympathetic to that, and I appreciate your time very much.